Today is gonna be a hairy day. No, not this hairy, although it does feel rather hairy. This kind of hairy, because I am out on the lookout and really a plane's going by just as I'm doing my intro. Because I wanna see what makes these animals just so magical. We're gonna be looking at hares in pulp culture, mythology, and of course, real life to see just how amazing these animals are. So you ready? Join the safari and let's get started. There's a variety of different animals we may find on today's nature walk. We may see some deer, some pheasants, some rabbits, and maybe even some hares. Notice how I said them as if they were two very different species, and that's because they are. Rabbits are smaller in size compared to hares and far more social. Rabbits also have the luxury of being burrowing animals. They like to hide in safety underground and even give birth down there. Although there is the one exception. The cottontails of North America do not burrow. Oh, there always has to be one, right? Whereas hares do not burrow. They rely on a far different adaptation to survive, which we'll get to later on. In fact, here in the UK, there are three different species of hare. The Irish hare, the mountain hare, and the one I'll probably see today, if I see one, the brown hare, which actually is introduced here to the United Kingdom. Some historians believe they were brought over during the times of the Romans, while others think they were brought over even earlier. Regardless, they've been here a while, but it's still interesting to find that they were originally brought over. But let's carry on and see what animals we can find. Guys, there's a deer right in front of me. This is so cool. The weather has certainly taken a turn for the not so good. So I'm hiding out in here and I thought we might as well talk about hares and pulp culture. And why I've decided to look at the magical side of hares. Well, ever heard of the Harry Potter series? You know, seven books, eight movies, couple of theme parks, plenty of merchandise, and a platform that you can run into at King's Cross? Yeah, that would. There's a character by the name of Luna Lovegood and her Patronus is in the shape of a hare, which is why I decided to look at them. And also because it's my friend Layla's birthday and she loves Luna and hares. So happy birthday, Layla. <coughs> Surprise. <laughs> now Luna is quite the lovable but eccentric character. In fact, there's two turns of phrases that may be used to describe Luna that involve hares. So the first phrase, is mad as a March hare. Now we're not meaning mad as in angry, we're talking as in mad like the Mad Hatter, a little loopy, you know? And sometimes Luna can be perceived to be mad by others. But are hares really mad? And why are they in March? Is that a species? <laughs> Let's find out. Well, it turns out mad as a March hare actually refers to the breeding season of hares. Now, it's not the typical animal courtship where the male flaunts his stuff in front of the ladies, you know, like peacocks do with their big beautiful tails. Oh no, it is much more competitive. It's very Olympic-like, actually. Hares are terribly quick. They have to be. In fact, they're Britain's fastest land mammal. And that's because that is their defensive strategy. You know, I mentioned rabbits and how they are able to burrow. Well, hares cannot. In fact, they need to run and run fast to outrun predators and apparently outrun each other. During the breeding season, a female will test the speed and agility of the males vying for her affections by simply running. The males will have to give chase over the course of quite the distance and if the female deems them worthy by being able to keep up with her and chase her down, then, well, they win. 
However, sometimes females aren't ready to be wooed by male hares, and so they could actually stop mid-run and turn around and give them the good left-right jab to say, not today, buddy. The second expression is hair-brained. Now, Luna is neither flighty or foolish, in my opinion, but the hares, well, they kind of are flighty. And for good reason, though, because that is what they have. As I mentioned, they need their speed in order to survive and to escape predators. They can't burrow underground like rabbits, so they need to be fast and always on edge, which is probably why I'm finding it rather difficult to find one here because they can hear me coming and run away and escape, which is rather unfortunate. But hey, we'll keep looking. And along the way, let's talk about the real magical side of hares, quite literally, because they're actually associated with witches. How ironic. But first, look at this. That looks rather cool. I'm not sure if I'd fit in there. Should I try? Let's give it a try. Snug as a bug in a rug even though it's cold and it's freezing. And I wish I was in a rug, but us, here we are. So hares actually do have a connection to the more magical side of things, other than that of Luna and her Patronus. In the medieval ages, hares were associated with witchcraft, for it was believed that witches could transform into hares, among many other animals, like black cats of all things, which if you haven't seen my video on black cats and if they're lucky or not, click up here. But hares also have a connection to mythology of a few other different cultures. Let's take a closer look at some examples. While well, I get out of here, of course. Hang on a second. First up are the Celts. The Celts admired the hares for their strength and speed. They were seen as very magical and mysterious, and so they treated them with caution. In fact, when the Romans invaded the British Isles, good old Julius Caesar noted that the Celtic people did not regard it lawful to eat the hare. It also makes sense because they associated the hare with women from the other world, who then could shapeshift into the form of a hare, so that made eating them definitely a no-go. Now, in Greek and Roman mythology, the hare represented love and abundance. Hares were often associated with Artemis, the goddess of the wild places and the hunt, and Artemis wouldn't permit young hares to be sacrificed, but rather left to her protection. I see a little friend. So hares also have a interesting connection to the moon, which is ironic given Luna's name. The hare is often mysterious as the dark side of the moon. They're often believed to be messengers between our world and the spirit world by moving via moonlight. This connection makes sense as hares are mainly nocturnal animals. It's typically a lot easier and safer to feed at night. And then they mainly rest during the day while they digest the previous night's food. Well, the hare has still evaded us, but we're gonna keep looking. And now would be the perfect time to actually discuss what adaptations they have that make them just so magical and apparently undetectable. First up are their ears, which are longer than those of rabbits and have black tips at the top. But why such large ears? Well, the better to hear predators with. They need to have excellent hearing to detect potential danger through sound. They also have large eyes that are set on the side of their head. This gives them almost 360 degree vision, thus the ability to see almost behind themselves. But my favorite real-life magical quality of hares is the fact that they eat their poo. Now, it's not as gnarly as you think it may sound. During the night, they produce special droppings 
They are called cecotropes. They're soft, moist, and stuck together. And the hares eat them relatively quickly, so that way their food gets a second chance to go through their gut and so they can absorb more nutrients. And only after this second journey is when the familiar dry pellets that we know and love come out. Guys, I think I see a hare hiding off in the distance. Of course, the one time that I am not recording is when I see the hare, but can you see it? How exciting, my first wild hare! Thank you so much, guys, for coming along on this journey with me. And happy birthday to my friend Layla. I hope you have a wonderful day, my dear. Give this video a thumbs up if you enjoyed it and you too are a fan of Luna Lovegood. In fact, why not head on over to my video right here in which you can see my friend Emma from Fan City Central and I talk about the Hogwarts houses in real life. They're real animal counterparts. Thanks for watching and I'll see you guys in the next video. Bye!